So hello and welcome to another podcast from the engineering department at Durham University. As always, my name is Chloe and today we're joined by Dr. Ido Amit, who is an assistant professor in the department. Welcome Ido, how are you? I'm okay, thank you. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So today we're hoping to talk a bit about your role as admissions tutor for the department um, and about some of the undergraduate programmes offered at Durham as well. Um, we'll also go and answer some of the questions about undergraduate admissions sent in by our followers on social media. Um, so thank you to everyone who sent those in. Uh, and then it'd be great to hear about your research and to find out what you enjoy doing outside the department. So to start with, what does being an admissions tutor for undergraduate study involve? Well, there's basically two major aspects to it. One of them is the promotion of the department and disseminating the knowledge of what it is that we actually do in Durham. So that goes through open days and publicity brochures, but also through um, specific talks to schools who might invite us to go there. Obviously, something that hasn't really happened over the last two years, but we're hoping that it will start again. And then the second aspect is the actual admission. So the department sets the target of how many students they want to intake and what the tariff, the entry tariff should be. And then I, along with central admissions who do actually most of the work, uh, we set those these targets and then we make sure that it's implemented. I do have some, some uh, discretion on whether or not to go a bit over or a bit uh, below, but Thankfully, in the last few years, it has been quite good and we were measure, we were able to, to stick with our tariff and accept excellent students. That's great. Um, and can you give us an overview of the different courses offered at Durham? So the MEng and the BEng um, and the dis different, dis different disciplines as well? Yeah, sure. So uh, Durham is a general engineering course, but I think that we're going to discuss that a bit later. Uh, if you do the BEng, so that's the three-year course, you have four different disciplines to choose from. We have mechanical, civil, electrical, and electronics engineering. <clears throat> These are the th three streams in the third year. And if you're doing the BEng, then you would graduate with one of these streams, one of these specialties. Um, then if you continue for the fourth year in the MEng program, we actually have two additional streams. One is the aeronautical engineering and the other one is the renewable energies, used to be known as new and renewable energies. And then there are some limitations as to how you go from one stream to it the other so to aeronautical you can get only through mechanical and to renewable energy you can get only through well from either electrical or mechanical engineering um, the other two civil and electronics you can get to them only through the civil or electronics uh, streams in the third year and that's because of the prerequisites you do need a lot of the third year knowledge to succeed in the fourth year yeah, so all that information is on our website as well. So for anyone who's interested, they can go and check that out there. Um, so for those listening who may not know about the structure of the courses at Durham, for both the BEng and the MEng degrees in any discipline, the first two years, uh, all students study general engineering. And then in their final year or two years, depending on whether you're doing the BEng or the MEng, um, students study their chosen discipline. Can you tell us, Ido, why the course is run in this way as opposed to specialising from the start and what are the benefits of this structure? Yes, of course. So we believe uh, as a department, and it's not something that we practice only in the teaching aspect, it's something that we practice in the research aspect of the department as well. We believe that engineers today need to be at least familiar with disciplines beyond the specialism. So... Yes, you may be an electronics engineer or a civil engineer, but even a civil engineer needs to know how a, a control module works. And even an electronics engineer needs to know how a beam uh, deflects. So let's say if I'm an electronics engineer and I'm designing a sensor that will measure the vibration of, I don't know, the wind, uh, the, the blade of a wind turbine, I need to actually know something about the mechanics of a wind turbine to make sure that my measurements make any sense and they give some sort of uh, insight to the mechanical engineers. 
And at the end of the day, we're assuming that our engineers will be in good leadership positions at, in their professional lives. So they will maybe manage a team of different type of engineers, civil engineers and mechanical engineers and electrical engineers, all in the same team. So it's really important that our engineers have a wide perspective of engineering aside from their specialty. Yeah, that's very true. And I know um, as well as that, also from speaking to sort of friends on the course, it's also quite useful if you're not 100% sure which stream you'd like to take. Um, it's quite useful because you get to experience them before you choose. So it's, it's definitely good to start in that way. Yeah, and we do see that a lot of students in, uh, come in on the first year and say, we're going to be mechanical engineers. And then after they experience something else, they find that actually maybe electrical engineering is more interesting for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so can you give us an idea of how the applications for undergraduate, how the application process for undergraduate courses work and when each stage of the process occurs? Yeah, so um, the UCAS cycle starts in September. It actually already started for this year. So that's for next year's intake. And students, so that's uh, year 13 and the equivalent around the world, start sending the applications around now. Uh, we don't look at them at this point. The UCAS deadline for fair uh, consideration is usually the 15th of January. Last year it was uh, delayed a bit because of COVID. So we don't look at anything before that deadline because we want to make sure that the playing field is level and everybody gets the same opportunity. When the deadline has passed, we get all the, uh, the um, applications to us. And then we start looking at them one by one to see uh, who is predicted to be able to study in Durham. So everybody who is predicted to be able to study in Durham gets an offer from us. So offers go out around February. And then from March until the end of May, we start getting responses from applicants who can choose to uh, give us a firm response on our offer or choose to give us an insurance or choose to decline the offer, that happens as well. And then once we have all the offers, um, the deadline, well, the offers are locked around June, and then we just sit and wait for results day. And as soon as we have those, we start uh, admitting or unfortunately not admitting some of the other uh, students. And when people are applying to Durham, what do you look for in a personal statement? Um, and another question that was actually asked on social media is, do you read all of the personal statements? Because I know that when I was applying, some people thought that you didn't read them all. So most of our admissions are now handled by central admissions in the university. Uh, they do look briefly at all personal statements, but really the personal statement become very important when we have two applicants with roughly the same uh, qualifications, and then we need to make some judgment call between them. That's when uh, personal statements really become very important. And what we're looking to see in the personal statements are some sort of um, commitment to engineering. So it could be any number of things. It could be that you really like engineering or maybe you did an extended project uh, in school that has some sort of an engineering uh, aspect to it. But it could also be that you're following some documentary show on building cars or taking them apart. If you like to build stuff by yourself or if you're a bit more like me, if you like taking stuff apart more than building them, then that shows something. But we're not looking only for real engineering or engineering related things. We're also looking to see who the candidate is. So we're looking at if you play sport, then it might mean that you're a good team player. That's also something that we're looking for. If you have uh, uh, awards for, for volunteering, says something about leadership. So that's also something we're looking for. That's great. Um, so another question we had in, can you tell us a bit about the technical and the research and development projects which make up part of the undergraduate courses? Yes, so we have um, technical projects for 
the uh, BN stream and some of the MN stream and then research and development projects for the rest, the majority of the MN uh, students. The difference between, between them is more of the scope. So how long or how much time you're going to invest in them, but not so much the quality. So we get very high quality from both the technical and the R&D projects. The, uh, the projects in general is an opportunity for the students to sit down one-on-one uh, -on -one with one of the academics and do some leading research. So study a problem that has never been solved before and has never, maybe haven't been looked at. So I can tell you about my students. My students in the, in the previous years have developed a new type of um, logic device that can have more than one, uh, more than two states. So most electronic uh, devices today are binary. They have zero and one. We started looking at devices that have zero, one, and two, and maybe can have more than that in the future. Uh, it's something that has been uh, going on for a few years now, but actually nobody thought about making a multiplexer uh, out of that. So we started doing that. Um, other students have been helping us us is Professor Daguzesi and me, develop a new type of measurement rig where you can put a sample on it, let's say a sensor of some type, and you can measure electronic properties, mechanical properties, and electromechanical properties all at the same rig, and it's completely automated. That's something that uh, a student started, I want to say two years ago, but maybe it was three. He's now a PhD student in the department and other students have continued that work and contributed quite a lot. That's great. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to when I get to do my project, I have to say. Um, so moving on from admissions, can you tell us a bit about the modules you teach and when during their degree students may come into contact with you? Yeah, so my core modules, let's call them that, are semiconductor physics and device for level three. I actually teach in two modules that are the same lecture course. So electronic stream, semiconductor physics and device. And for the electrical stream, it's called power semiconductor devices, but the lectures are the same. So I teach in both of that, that's level three. And then in level four, I teach um, advanced electronic measurements for, that's for the electronic stream. And student might also encounter me on level three design, where I, um, I lead some of the, uh, some of the groups. Um, I think you and I met actually on level one, where I was doing some cover work um, for analog electronics, but yep. that's something I do quite rarely, so. That's all right. And uh, in terms of research, I understand that you're currently working on projects involving low dimensional electronics and functional microscopy. Can you tell us a bit more about this and any other research you've done that you've particularly enjoyed? So I've started working on low dimensional electronics back in my PhD, and I'm slowly incorporating more dimensions. So I started with one dimensional nanowires and I've now moved to two dimensional um, well, it's like nano sheets of, of uh, materials, materials that are that can be a few microns wide, a few tens of microns, but only a few atoms thick. It's quite interesting because they have interesting properties that are not really related to the bulk counterparts. And what I'm really interested in is how current go flows through them and how they can retain charge because basically for a material to remember, for us to be able to generate memory modules, it has to retain charge in some way and we need to be able to sense how much charge it retains. So with these materials, because of the very weird dimensions, because almost the entire material is an interface, charge retention is quite different. And one of the things that I really enjoyed in the last few years is we had a material, we did some very basic current voltage characteristics on it, and it struck us as something very odd that it didn't behave like any type of model that we knew about. So models were written in the 1970s maybe for, for this type of materials, but for semiconductors, but semiconductors have started shrinking quite drastically. And then we got to the point where none of the models that were around 
actually describe the physics of what was happening inside the device. So I managed to devise a new model and test it. And lucky for me, the model not only works, it actually generated a new type of measurement, new type of spectroscopy that we can do. And that was very excited, exciting, at least for me. Yeah, no, that sounds really interesting, really interesting. Um, and how have you found working in the engineering department at Durham? What have you most enjoyed? I think the best part of Durham is the uh, collegiality, the friendliness. Everybody is quite friendly. You can walk into almost anybody's um, office and have a brief chat about your research or about anything else. And a lot of our equipment is shared. So for me, as a relatively new member of staff, it wasn't too difficult to start research because I could use other people's equipment when I needed it. And now that I have some of my own equipment, other people use it. So we do collaborate quite a lot. And it's a good environment to work with. Yeah, it's, it's a lovely environment as a student as well. Um, so finally, when you're not working in the department, what is it that you enjoy doing in your free time? I really like cooking and I like reading. I've recently taken up uh, cycling after a very long break since my teenage days. Uh, that was mostly so that I can shed some extra lockdown pounds, but I'm really enjoying it now, just being outside on bikes. It's really a lot of fun. Yeah, no, that's lovely. Um, so thank you so much for joining us, Ido. It's been great to hear from you. Um, and thank you to everyone who's been listening. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast. Be sure to keep an eye out on our social media pages, for future episodes and for news about our department. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs>